traveled more than 7,000 kilometers to Korea. Each individual had his own reasons to help people in need here during war for political reasons, to contain communism, to contribute with humanitarian aid. Firmly set against war anywhere in the world. Sort of the first step back into the international community for Germany. We knew how being alone is difficult. War is a terrible thing. Bombardment and... Uh, Three members of the unit were killed in action. Lying together in blood. So many refugees. Strong reason and a heavy responsibility. For everlasting peace. Your sacrifice will never be forgotten. Hello, my name is Jakob Hallgren. I am the Swedish ambassador to the Republic of Korea. So the reason why Sweden chose to offer a field hospital is because Sweden had actually quite a lot of experience when it came to humanitarian interventions from the end of the Second World War. You might have heard of Raoul Wallenberg, who saved many Jews in Budapest. And then the most important episode and experience, I believe, is when Folke Bernadotte took Swedish Red Cross buses to the concentration camps in northern Germany and saved many Jews from the concentration camps. And all of that provided a background and an experience which was uh, important. The Swedish Red Cross Field Hospital was placed in Busan in September 1950. That's where the fighting was at the time. Busan was essentially encircled, the so-called Busan perimeter, with North Korean forces occupying almost all of the rest of South Korea. So that was the only place they could uh, put a field hospital at that time. As the front line moved, uh, to the north, it was decided that the Swedish field hospital would still remain in Busan because it was a good hospital, it served a very important purpose, not to follow the front line, but actually taking care of war wounded who could return to the front. But this also meant that they could take care of other wounded and other injured. So increasingly, at the field, Swedish field hospital, they took care of, of civilian Koreans. There were many refugees in, in Busan, and there were many diseases at the time, TBC, dysentery, etc., etc. Et so they opened a separate clinic for civilian people. So every day there was a queue outside the Swedish field hospital to take care of these civilian Koreans. So here I have a, a wonderful memory or souvenir of this time. It is a lady who was a young girl when she came to the Swedish field hospital and she was treated by the Swedish uh, doctors there. <laughs> Sweden, <laughs> 
입원실에서 환자들하고 같이 찍은 사진 너무 그리 저를 아끼고 사랑해 주신 스베니노 림벨 51년도에 감기 끝에 능망염이 왔습니다. 스웨덴 병원에 표를 하나 얻은 누가 더 줘서 그 표를 가지고 스웨덴 병원에 가서 치료를 받게 되었습니다. 그 야전병원 덕택으로 지금 이렇게 건강하게 80이 넘은 할머니가 돼서도 노인대학도 가고 합창도 하고 하모니카도 배우고 <웃음> 열심히 지금 살고 있습니다. 그래서 항상 스웨덴 스웨덴 가슴이 설레이도록 잊지 않고 있어요. 대사관에서 젊을 때의 사진을 구해주셔서 그래서 이 사진을 저는 항상 저희 방에 두고 고맙게 생각하고 아침 저녁으로 보고 있습니다. So uh, this is the National Medical Center in Seoul. This is the hospital that was uh, constructed and opened as a result of the Danish, the Norwegian and the Swedish medical units and medical contributions to the Korean uh, War. So uh, they wanted to contribute to long-term healthcare and long-term long public health in this uh, country. So it was set up in 1958. It was run by the three Scandinavian governments, Norway, Denmark and Sweden, for 10 years. And then it was taken over by the Korean government and it still exists today, which is quite amazing. Fantastic with all the three, the nurses and the doctors of the three Scandinavian countries and all of the Korean patients and also young doctors and nurses from Korea who worked here and who were trained. It's quite amazing. My mother, who passed away this year, one of her best friends uh, served in the field hospital, and I know that she was very proud of, of, of that. Uh, and I think she, <laughs> she should be, because back then, with the travel opportunities of that time, that 150 Swedes and a whole field hospital traveled more than 7,000 kilometers to help uh, uh, people in need here during war, that, that's quite extraordinary. And they were all volunteers. They wanted to do it. I think that that was quite something yeah, to be proud of. It's overwhelming to see the enormous development of South Korea since the Korean War. This is a testament, among other things, to how important humanitarian action is. I'm so proud that Sweden participated in this effort and sent a field hospital to heal the war wounded and civilians, regardless of nationality, friends and foes. This effort and this sacrifice becomes a strong reason and a heavy responsibility for all of us to continue to work for peace on the Korean Peninsula, so that the efforts of our ancestors are not in vain.
I'm Stefan Auer, the Ambassador of Germany to Republic of Korea. Um, I have here a map which perhaps can very well explain the situation of Germany at that time. After the Second World War, Germany was divided into four occupational zones. The British one, the American one, the French one down here, and the occupational zone of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Then in 1949, the Western zones united to form the Western, Western Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, while as the Soviet Union uh, helped to create the East German part, which is the, uh, the German Democratic Republic. So there was a division going through the middle of Germany, which went along these lines here. That was the situation when, in 1950, the Korean War broke out. In 1953, the then Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, that is to say of the western part of Germany, flew to the United States of America. And the then President of the United States of America asked Germany to contribute to the Korean War. So the then Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, came up with the idea of dispatching a hospital of the German Red Cross to Korea. You have to know that uh, in the short, right after the Second World War, there, is a, there was also a big understanding also for the situation here in Korea, because on the Korean Peninsula, you also had a divided nation. At the same time, of course, it was also sort of a first step back into the international community for Germany after what the Nazis has committed as atrocities um, during uh, the Third Reich, you know, from 33 to 45. Um, so that was the first move back into civilization and into the international community. Now, when it comes to the East, uh, to East Germany, there, of course, also seeing that uh, also East Germans were witnessing the separation of a nation, they had a lot of sympathies, of course, for North Koreans. They collected a lot of money and contributed a lot. Um, the catchword at that time was help Germany by helping Koreans. So uh, they collected a lot of money and they even created sort of a committee, Korean support committee, to, you know, collect the money and then transfer it to their counterparts in North Korea. It was such a huge uh, contribution that was around about 500 and f over 500 million marks at that time, so half a billion marks, East marks at that time, that it is, was listed a third biggest contribution to North Korea after China and Soviet Union's contribution to North Korea. The decision was taken in April 53, that was a couple of months before the armistice was signed. It took, of course, some time to arrive in East Asia, and uh, it finally arrived uh, in, in 54, beginning of 54, in Busan, when then it was, you know, a hospital was uh, erected in the city of Busan, and the, the equipment, medical equipment, and the doctors and nurses and medical staff, uh, you know, equipped this hospital to, to become operational in uh, May 54. And that was after the Korean War had ended, when the armistice was signed. I brought along a magazine of the German Red Cross, which is dedicated exactly to the German Red Cross Hospital in Busan. Then we have a report here of a doctor also working at the Busan Hospital, and he's Korean, U Won Yong, and he wrote about the German doctors at the hospital in general, but in particular about Professor Uwe and others. Uwe hat nicht nur als Arzt geholfen, sondern auch als Mensch. Er war ein Vorbild an professionelle Fürsorge. Er war sehr auf Ordnung bedacht und hat Tag und Nacht gearbeitet. Dabei war er nie lieb, war er immer liebenswürdig, nie schlechter Laune. Überhaupt dachten die meisten deutschen Ärzte nur an die Patienten, nicht an sich. Auch wir koreanische Ärzte haben rund um die Uhr gearbeitet und waren immer in Bereitschaft. Ein Privatleben hatten wir nicht. Äh, 
um, East Germans helped to rebuild the city of Hanhong in North Korea. And also, you know, there were personal contacts. Many North Korean students were sent to East German universities to study at East German universities and also orphans, uh, North Korean orphans, whose parents had died during the Korean War, were adopted by East Germans. So you see there a, was a very strong bond and human bond between East Germans and North Koreans at that time. As well, as, as you can imagine, as a German ambassador, I'm very often asked that question. Um, and indeed, I think there is no other nation in the world which really sympathizes and can really appreciate what the Koreans must be going through as a divided nation because of our joint history of a divided nation. So there surely are some uh, lessons uh, learned which could be of benefit to the Korean situation. Germany uh, initiated the Second World War, so we had to build the trust with our neighbors. We had to convince our neighbors that the reunified Germany would not uh, be aggressive anymore and not dominant in the center of Europe. At the same time, when Willy Brandt came then to power as a uh, Federal Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. He initiated the new Ostpolitik, which is translated the new Eastern policy. And he then um, signed treaties with the Soviet Union, with Poland, Czechoslovakia, and also with the German Democratic Republic, which sort of you know, recognized the status quo at that time, which wasn't easy, of course, because at that time, West Germany was the one who, uh, who represented the whole of Germany. So it was not easy to accept that because it also contributed to a sort of a consolidation of the East German regime and of the situation as it was in, in Eastern Europe. But at the end, this proved that we, we, we got the confidence and the trust of the neighbors surrounding Germany, which in the end also facilitated a lot the unification process and embedding this unification process into the regional and international arena. As a German ambassador, um, and from the bottom of my heart, I really wish our Korean friends that they will be able to celebrate the reunification in peace and freedom in the not too distant future. Korea is the historical proof that the international community and multilateralism make a difference, especially when it comes to peace, freedom and human rights. We are proud to be part of this multilateral community with a modest humanitarian contribution and we wish Korea all success in its detente towards peace and unity on the Korean Peninsula. Turkish troops arrived in Husan on October 17, 1950. Just one day after China declared that it would take part in the Korean War on North Korea's side. As soon as they landed, they headed for the Yellow River to stop the advance of Chinese troops. However, they were trapped in a siege as the Chinese troops carried out a surprise attack. After the North Korean troops invaded the South Korea, a UN Security Council has taken a decision to form a UN force. So upon their call, Turkish government has decided uh, to dispatch troops to Korea. They are not all volunteered. 
but upon the announcement of uh, troop uh, dispatched to Korea, thousands of men and women volunteered to go fight with the enemy and to save the liberty and independence of brotherly Koreans. One of the distinctive features of the Turkish uh, military participation in the Korean wa War was the humanitarian side. The Turkish soldiers did not only fight in the Korean soil against the enemy, but also took care of the civilians, particularly the orphans. Here you will see uh, a girl is holding the hand of Lieutenant Mehmet Gönenç. Lieutenant Gönenç is among the most famous martyrs in Turkey. His heroic action in Kunuri is remembered by all elderly and learned by the new generations. The Battle of Wawon, in which he, ha he has shown his heroic action, was the first battle of the Turkish Brigade after arrival in uh, Korea. The 9th Infantry Division fought fiercely the Chinese uh, enemy forces. Here is the battle log of the situation at that time. On 22nd April 1951, approximately 1900 o'clock, the Chinese Communist Army had been bombarding for 40 minutes. The Turkish gunner observation officer, Lieutenant Mehmet Gönenç, sent the following radio message. Enemy forces occupied the hill where our company is stationed. I'm now giving the coordinates for the artillery battalion to fire. Artillery liaison officer was puzzled and replied, but isn't this the place where your company is located? Lieutenant Gönenç answered, yes, we don't want to be taken captive by the enemy. Do not abandon us to the enemy. To be fallen by our own artillery fire is our last wish and hope. We are sending you the exact coordinates again. All artillery corps, please fire at this location. After this last message, the communications were cut. The officers contemplated over Lieutenant Gönen's words and decided to fulfill his last wish. Turkish artillery battalion fired on those coordinates while bursting into tears. I believe there are two reasons behind Lieutenant Gönen's decision. The first is that in Turkish culture, martyrdom is the highest rank in the universe one soldier can reach. He wanted to be a martyr. Secondly, being captive by the enemy forces is considered as an insult for a Turkish soldier. I think that's why Lieutenant Gönen has decided to be shot down. Turkey is Number four, uh, the largest troop contributor to the Korean War. And number three, in terms of the number of martyrs. And since then, we consider the Korean people as our brothers. We believe uh, in peace. We believe one day uh, two Koreas will be reunified. Wars are ferocious because they seek to annihilate rather than to create. Wars are immoral because they thrive on hatred rather than love. They tear apart peoples and make brotherhood impossible, as it was the case in the Korean Peninsula 70 years ago. We must be soldiers of peace who will strive for replacing the old paradigm of violence and conflict with a new paradigm of aging peace. Today, many of my friends are eternally sleeping in the mountains of Korea. We woke up in the morning smiling and playing together. But these friends did not return in the evening. None of them were sad as they took their last breath. Perhaps their last words were Ahvatan.
India has always been a very strong advocate of uh, peace and non-violence as being the means of bringing about understanding between all the people of the world and these were principles that were really embraced and practiced in a very real sense by the father of the Indian nation, Mahatma Gandhi. Well, at the time that the war broke out on the Korean Peninsula, the experience of the partition of India and uh, the first India-Pakistan war was still very fresh in the minds of the Indian people. India had tried to initiate a ceasefire proposal at the UN Security Council, but this did not succeed and in June 1950, the United Nations Security Council had passed a resolution asking for steps to be taken to repel the armed forces who had invaded from North Korea into South Korea. The government of India also responded by sending the uh, 60th Parachute Field Hospital, the Field Ambulance, to provide uh, medical support to the friendly people of Korea. In fact, even at that time, the, uh, the unit was uh, briefed personally by the then Prime Minister of India, uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and were uh, made aware of the kind of contribution that they were making on behalf of the people of India to the, uh, to the uh, South Korean people and to the uh, progressive and liberal forces. India's 60th Parachute Field Hospital accordingly arrived in Busan Harbor in November 1950. It was uh, split into two parts and uh, two echelons and one was uh, associated with the, uh, with the Commonwealth Brigade and located in uh, Pyongyang while the other was, uh, uh, was located in Daegu where it was uh, tasked with uh, creating a field hospital and uh, providing training to Korean uh, combat medics. During its uh, tour of duty of almost four years, 60th Para Field provided uh, medical support to uh, almost 225,000 soldiers and uh, Korean civilians, most of whom were on the battlefield. And in this process, uh, three members of the unit were killed in action, while 23 suffered injuries. But there weren't only heartbreaking stories. Uh, I would like to tell you uh, an amazing story of survival and enterprise against all odds. This is the story of the, of the echelon of the 60th Para Field Unit which actually moved to Pyongyang and uh, pro was providing support on the bat battlefield to soldiers and uh, civilians who had been wounded in the, in the course of the war. So this is uh, the commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rangaraj, who led his, uh, his men and uh, was uh, uh, providing this medical support to people on the battlefield. There are about 2,500 people who were uh, supported in this manner. In uh, December 1950, uh, the commanding officer of the unit was faced with a, what seemed to be an insurmountable dilemma. He had the option of uh, either uh, leaving behind the wounded people and in his care and all the, all the medical equipment and uh, moving away, or he had the option of uh, remaining on the, on the battlefield and facing attack from the, uh, from the advancing forces of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army. As it seemed impossible that he would be able to move away and get uh, safe passage for ferrying wounded uh, soldiers and all the equipment that they had as part of the unit uh, safely from Pyongyang to Seoul. But the commanding officer managed to find a third alternative whereby he was able to safeguard the soldiers in his care and his equipment and uh, yet uh, move away. Uh, some members of his unit had located a locomotive and some freight cars close by and uh, they managed to get that, uh, uh, get all the equipment and supplies of the medical unit and the, and the wounded people loaded onto those freight cars. They linked up the locomotive and the cars and they drove that uh, train all the way from Pyongyang to Seoul, uh, literally escaping uh, within minutes, uh, crossing the bridge uh, uh, just minutes before the bridge was blown up by the U.S. Engineers Corps uh, to take their people back to Seoul to safety. 
this train carrying the men and the uh, soldiers in the care of the field unit was the last to leave from uh, Pyongyang before the destruction of the bridge. And had it not been for the enterprise and the initiative and the very quick thinking on the part of the uh, members of this unit, I think the fate of that unit and of the people in its care would have been very, very different. Well, I must say that as the Indian ambassador to uh, Korea, I feel a deep sense of pride in uh, the contributions that have been made by our uh, soldiers and men to this call which was made by the international community uh, for us to uh, go to the, to the support of the friendly people of Korea. It was a humanitarian mission and I am just, uh, I, I cannot think of a better word of, for describing it than to say that I feel uh, truly proud of what we have done. On behalf of the government and the people of India, I salute you for your courage and for your selfless services rendered during the Inter-Korean War in 1950-53. Your sacrifices contributed to the restoration of peace on the Korean Peninsula, peace that has prevailed for 67 years now. As members of the international community, and as a nation that has always prized peace, we will strive for everlasting peace so that your sacrifices do not go in vain. Ernest Armand, Raymond Bardiot, Pierre Beaupré, Alfred Biron, François Bouhartz. A total of 106 soldiers fell, and they were all volunteers. The youngest was soldier Gustave Goutals, who died at 20, while the oldest was Lieutenant Pierre Beaupré, who was 29. Some were students, while others were married with children. I am Peter Lesquier, the Ambassador of Belgium to the Republic of Korea and to the People's Republic of Korea. Belgium had been invaded twice in the first half of the 20th uh, century and was therefore really sympathizing with uh, what the population in the Republic of Korea suffered. So there were a lot of people who wanted to help the country and such did also the government. The government decided officially only in August 1950 to send a Belgian battalion to the Korean War. So one of the most remarkable volunteers was the Minister of Defence, Mr. Henri Moreau de Melen. He had defended the fact that Belgium should participate in uh, the Korean War from the start. And so once the decision was made to send an infantry battalion uh, to Korea, he uh, resigned from his post as Minister of Defence and he joined the troops uh, to fight in Korea. So he was one of the volunteers going to Korea. Mr. Moreau de Melen suffered a lot uh, during the Second World War. He was uh, made prisoner by the, the Nazis and he knew what it was to suffer under a war. And he felt that he had to show, that Belgium had to show solidarity, not only in words, but also in deeds. The 18th of December 1950, the voluntary corps went on board in Antwerp and arrived a month later on the 31st of January 1951 in Busan. Maybe I could read you something from the memoirs 
of uh, Rick Wouters, one of the uh, combatants at, uh, in the Belgian uh, battalion. Vele gewonden lagen of zaten ergens kreunend met gezichten onder stof, waardoor bloed kleine beetjes trok. Ik maakte aanstalten om naar mijn positie terug te gaan als ik een van mijn mannen zag staan jammeren tegen Moreau de Melen, verbindingsofficier van het bataljon. Ik wil niet meer terug naar boven. Ik wil hier weg. Ik wil chauffeur worden. Moreau de Melen trachtte hem te troosten en te overtuigen dat hij niet weg kon. En toen, over de schouder van bange man heen, zag hij mij. Is dat een van uw mannen? Ik knikte. Neem hem mee, zei hij zacht. Ik voelde met bange man mee, pakte hem bij zijn schouders en zei, kom jong. Zonder woorden voelde hij me gewillig terug naar zijn positie. De avond begon te vallen. Onze mortieren en de Amerikaanse artillerie begonnen hun vuur te regelen. Overal weer klonken zware inslagen rondom onze berg. Ik had geen honger, was moe. Mijn handen en broek zaten nog onder gedroogd bloed. En het water was te zeldzaam om er zich mee te wassen. Voor de eerste keer zat ik te mijmeren wat ik hier wel deed, terwijl mijn vrienden thuis zich wel ergens aan het amuseren waren. Many youths who participated in the Korean War must have felt the same. I met Korean War veterans on several occasions, both Belgian and uh, Korean War veterans. Most of them are, are very old, of course. They are in their 80s and in their 90s. They don't like to repeat the horrible experiences they have gone through when they were fighting. If you ask them about their experience at that time, they prefer to talk about the funny things or, or uh, 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 rather than the occasions where they were wounded themselves or so their comrades die. I think it's uh, obvious uh, war is a terrible thing. It's doing a lot of harm to uh, people's lives. And so after such a long time, who was the enemy and who uh, was the ally matters less than the horrors that uh, were experienced during that war. We hope that at a certain point in time, the leader of DPRK will uh, change his mind and know that in order to economically develop to have a prosperous country, he has to abandon, abandon his uh, nuclear arsenal and uh, so that the UN sanctions can be lifted. Fallen heroes from the Korean War, you came to a faraway country to sacrifice your lives for the freedom and happiness of the people of South Korea. Your sacrifice has not been in vain. South Korea is now a vibrant democracy and an economic powerhouse in Asia. You and your comrades from the nations that fought under the United Nations flag assured the survival of a country that after the war has made valuable contributions to global peace and prosperity. Your sacrifice will never be forgotten. Rest in peace.
On January 23, 1951, about 10,000 Danes gathered on the Lange Linie Quay in Copenhagen. They gave a warm farewell to the hospital ship Jutlandia, leaving to help Koreans suffering from the Korean War. The whole nation wished the ship good luck and safe travel. It was a long journey. After the immense suffering and tragedies of World War II, it was meaningful as a small country, such as Denmark, to contribute with humanitarian aid to support the fight for another small country's freedom. Danes were very quick to support the government's decision to send a hospital ship to aid the Republic of Korea and the United Nations Command. The ship was equipped with cutting-edge medical technology and facilities for almost 400 patients. When it arrived in uh, Busan in March 7, 1951, it immediately started to treat patients uh, coming from the battlefields. Later, the front line became fixed at the 38th parallel, and uh, Jutlandia was moved uh, from Busan to Incheon Harbor on the 20th of no November 1952. This was done in order for the ship to be closer to the battlefield and be able to treat more soldiers. The 38th parallel was marked by severe battles with great casualties. As such, the medical staff on Jutlandia did not waver in their conviction to treat the wounded despite being closer to danger and the enemy fire that did an impressive work. Almost 5,000 injured soldiers from 24 different countries were treated on Jutlandia. Originally, uh, only soldiers were supposed to be treated on Jutlandia, but the nurses and uh, doctors persuaded the forces to permit them that they could also treat civilians. And it's actually estimated around 6,000 civilians were treated on Jutlandia in the time the ship was there, and only 29 civilians lost their life which is very impressive, I must say. They've done a great job. The staff on Jutlandia did not only stay on board the ship, they actually also traveled to other parts of uh, Korea. They went to, for instance, to Daegu, where battles were taking place. And there they treated patients as well. There are many records from the ship uh, that gives a glimpse of everyday life and how what the staff went through living on the ship. For example, uh, this letter here, uh, from a Danish doctor, Dr. Rasmus Muvin, that decided to go to Korea, but regularly wrote back to his wife in Denmark. In your letter, you write, but why you, who have a wife and children to take care of? Yes, but they will have to carry their part of the burden. If you are under the impression that I should not be here, they will be left to die in their own filth. The work I do now is probably the best I am ever going to do. You cannot tear me away. I have included pictures of a few patients in the letter. You may think that it is out of place, but it is not, Mina. This is their condition when they arrive. It's horrible to look at and impossible to walk past while thinking, not my district. If you find this letter has a bitter tone, you might be right, but I feel we must be honest with each other. To say that I work in a war zone is simply wrong. Tegu is safe, which is also why they keep sending refugees down here from the north. Darling, I refuse to end my letter on a bitter note. I love you, and I mean it when I say, if you must travel, please do so. I hope to find you healthy and happy on my return. Yours, Ross. I believe all that went there volunteered uh, because, you know, it's entering into a battlefield, you could say. But many of them also came back with great memories of uh, Korea, you know, how the people were living there even though it was very poor and, and difficult at that time. When Jutlandia sailed back to Denmark in August uh, 16, 1953, 13 doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers decided to stay behind to help the local people. 
A few years later, in 1958, they established a medical center that became the basis for what we today know as the National Medical Center in Seoul. And I'm very proud that Danes helped set up this center. The ship also donated medicine and medical equipment to civilian hospitals before it left for Denmark. Whatever the solution, I believe it will be and has to be based on peaceful dialogue and mutual goodwill. I think dialogue is key to solving any uh, differences. Uh, we need to understand each other better and we need to accept each other's differences. I salute the bravery and dedication of the Jutlandia veterans who contributed to the strong foundation upon which the friendship between Denmark and Korea continues to flourish. There's nothing more sacred than a human life. We, as a human race, should always remember that war is a man-made disaster that can be avoided. We must all learn to be more forgiving and to accept differences. I hope for peace on the Korean Peninsula and in all parts of the world. Literally, Kanyo means to look out or to check out something. When uh, our Emperor Haile Selassie uh, gave this name for our uh, soldiers, that means he intended to give mission for his uh, army to bring peace back to the, the South Koreans. They fought 253 battles and they, they, they won all, all of them and none of them were war of prisoners after the wars. I'm Shifar Rashid Butim, Wolasa, Ethiopian ambassador to the Republic of Korea. The, the Korean Peninsula War broke out uh, after a decade when Ethiopian was uh, tried to protect itself from the aggression of fascist Italia for, for in Ethiopia, uh, fought for its so, uh, sovereignty. And at that time, we have special uh, um, uh, memory of being alone during aggression. And we didn't find uh, any support. We didn't get any support. We didn't get any support from the League of Nations. We fought by ourselves and we protected our sovereignty. After that, uh, United Nations sent appeal to us, uh, to the Ethiopian government, uh, to protect the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the South Koreans from the Peninsula War, and uh, we, we were very sympathizers. The, the, our the king, Ali Selassie, was a uh, very sympathizer of that, and uh, he pledged to dispatch from his Imperial Guard uh, battalion of uh, elites. We knew how being alone is difficult, and we felt being alone, and we felt how aggression is bad and harmful for the citizens. As you know, Ethiopia is an equator and we don't have snow. And our winter is, uh, we don't have like your type of winter. And when our soldiers, they came here, I think the second battle alone or in 1951, they came on winter and the snow was uh, raining. There is um, the interview of one of, one of those veterans, it says, it reads like this. I saw white powder falling from the sky for the first time in my life. The temperature would go down to negative 30 degrees and no matter how many layers of clothes I put on, I could not stop shivering. Despite the cold, I was memorized by the snow and kept looking up the, at the sky. Sadly, the enemy wearing white camouflage began attacking us in the, the snow. It was unimaginable to think that the enemy would be staking out the white snow. 
wearing white camouflage. The Korean War veterans, I think they are less than 300 people. They are above age 85. There is a village which was given to them by the emperor and uh, they have their own association. That association is organizing them, for them, uh, different um, supportive mechanisms uh, from the Ethiopian government and from the foreign, foreign, Korean government. So uh, this, uh, this about less than 300 people are living and are alive now in Ethiopia. I would like to um, introduce a special um, story about Ethiopian soldier and the Korean boy. Ethiopian soldier, his name is Bulcha, who was uh, 19 during that, the war, uh, found a Korean boy. His name is Park Dungha, and his mother was passed away during the war. By the, uh, she was a victim of the war, and he took this boy to his camp, uh, and he tried to raise him uh, while he was here in Korea. And after he finished his term, he's in Korea, he gave this boy to orphanage. He, did, he didn't see him after they uh, depart from here, but still Bulcha is very sympathetic to see this boy. And after um, this all time, he's still remembering this boy and asking about him. And he, he would like to know about him. And we would like to uh, connect them if Park Tung Ha is alive and interested to meet Bulcha. So if anybody who knew Park Tung Ha or himself, person is at that time he was boy, I think now he is about, uh, about age of 70. So our embassy is uh, keen to see and meet him and connect him with Bulcha. We Ethiopians participated on the Korean Peninsula War and we had civil war and war with neighboring countries. We know how war is very destructive. It consumes human and material resources. By all means, we all human beings should avoid war and strive for peace for peace. Peace is an important instrument for coexistence and development.